Hi fellow woodturners, welcome back to my shop. In this third part of the three part video on stool making, we want to concentrate our efforts on duplicating the, the legs for a four legged stool. I know a lot of turners don't get into wood turning in order to uh, make furni furniture parts or, or turn spindles, they get into it for bowl turning. I know one one experienced uh, turner in my club who's been turning for several years and he recently came to an all-day workshop uh, that involved some spindle work and I was surprised to find out he didn't even own a spindle gouge. But like a fellow in my men's group at church commented at one meeting, we're not here to judge. But I'm hoping that the information that I presented in this series might get some of y'all motivated to try some, some spindle work. The principles and techniques we use for, for duplicating the uh, legs in this four-legged stool are the same things you would apply to any duplicating project uh, involving uh, such as table legs or, or other furniture parts. There's really no need for any fancy duplicators. If you're only going to turn four or five, uh, say, say four pieces, you don't need a duplicator. Using the techniques I show you, you're going to make things reasonably close. This wheel when you turn spindles, they don't have to be identical. They just have to look identical. And we've all done those exercises where you read something and, and there's letters missing and you can still understand the words. And that's because your brain wants to make sense out of these things. So if, if, if you see things that are supposed to look alike, your brain's going to generally tell you, at least for most of us, that, that, that they're alike. So it's not that big a deal. If there are minor variations, it adds a certain amount of uh, character uh, it makes people realize it's, it's handcrafted, so there's nothing wrong with that. Let's talk a little bit about, before you get started, about drawing a, a pattern. Um, it's good to draw a full-size diagram of what you're going to be turning. And there are some rules to it, and I'll show you a close-up of this in, in just a moment. Um, first of all, make the drawings full-size. Parts, uh, you know, uh, 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 not to scale drawing is not going to do a whole lot of good for you making a spindle. Uh, something that, that I didn't learn the first time I did it, and here's a, and you can see this, this storyboard, uh, and that's what they call this, a storyboard. You make it out of a quarter, quarter inch uh, uh, sheet of plywood or a thin strip of, of wood. Uh, but, but some of the rules for the storyboard are that the dimensions ought to, uh, the longitudinal dimensions ought to run one at a time, and this is probably a better, I don't know if y'all can, y'all can see this, but draw them with arrows connecting from feature to feature that's going to be significant as you lay it out, and then within uh, each arrow touches on another area, and then draw the dimension inside in a, in a in a broken area. Don't put anything inside, don't put any uh, measurements inside your drawing because they're just going inter to interfere and, and get in the way. You draw them on the outside uh, with arrows pointing that showing your your diameters. And uh, for your features, draw it all the way across. So those are some of the basic uh, basic rules. Uh, also show an overall uh, an overall length of the pro of the project on your drawing. In this case, for this one, we're going to be doing for the spool project ten and a half inches, and that's that's what this one is. Uh, one of the things that'll help you draw these is uh, might help you is a, is a contour guide, and it'll, it'll help you get some idea down on on paper. The other trick is when you draw it. Draw only half of it, then you can open it up and do the rest of it. Then you can transfer this to your storyboard. Now your storyboard should have little notches at these key marking areas, so you can just lay a pencil, lay this up against your, uh, your blank and put a pencil on it and mark those areas. And you can notch this with a knife or you can notch it with a, with a file. So those are just a couple of ideas on, on drawing. I, I always draw a pro I mean always make a prototype. Uh, these are the two prototypes I made for this four-legged stool because I wasn't sure about the design. When I changed my original design, which I had done, and there's in effect the storyboard, I just put it on this 
a piece of paper, uh, but I could march it, mark, mark it. Uh, when I went from this design, where the uh, stretchers all went into the same place, which, as it turns out, is a hassle. And I realized that on this one, I didn't want to do it that way, so I offset one of them. Unfortunately, when I offset it, it created its own problems in that I had to change the design because there, you just couldn't make a big uh, bead here that would cover both those holes. So I wound up having to, to put a little V in there, and then I also decided to make a couple of little V cuts um, um, there to, to kind of highlight that. But turning prototypes is good. Here's a prototype that goes along with this storyboard that, that I turned. It's out of a, some glued up 2x4s uh, for some uh, baluster project that, that, that I had. And that's when I went to the trouble to, for the first time to learn how to use a storyboard and, and mark it up. The key thing, and, and we'll do some of this, let me show you some of this at, at the lathe, but before we get there, uh, let me show you a couple of other gimmicks. Um, it is important when you're marking centers, you know, that you get it centered. Uh, you can use a, a center finder. If you're doing production work, if you're doing a lot of these, sometimes it help, helps to have some type of uh, fast marking like this Veritas gauge, gauge, uh, gauge uh, where you can just put the item in there, smack it with a mallet, turn it, smack it again, and then turn it again. Uh, unless it's been milled, you want to turn it all four, uh, four, four directions or you're not necessarily going to get the center. And most of my stock winds up not being milled. It's generally pretty rough sawn on the table saw. We're not going to get into uh, pommel cuts uh, as we uh, talk about spindles today. That's that cut you have on a chair leg uh, or a table leg possibly where where you have flat areas for, for an apron. Uh, the, but suffice it to say, use straight stock, use mill lumber, always cut your blanks to the exact length. Uh, it's just an extra operation to have to come back and, and cut it later. The one exception might be if you're doing lots and lots of balusters that someone else is going to be installing and you might give a certain fixed length of excess on, on one side in order that the finished carpenter can, can make those adjustments. Um, cut it to exact length. And milled lumber. Okay, let's, let's go over to the, to the lathe and continue marking up those uh, spindles that we're going to be turning for, for our uh, four-legged stool project. Okay, here's a close-up I promised you. Here's a storyboard, one of the early ones I did, that's showing the incorrect way to put the inside dimensions, where it's on the inside of the drawing and, and tends to clutter it up and, and be confusing. Here's the, the new revised one I did for this stool project. So along the top you've got a, an overall length, one line with the distance in the middle, and then for each feature you've got the length of that feature, all of them connecting one to another separated by arrows with the, the distances or the measurements actually in a, in a broken area between the lines. And at the bottom you'll see again the diameter the diameter measurements are out to the side and with an arrow drawn to where that diameter is and don't put the dimensions on the inside. Okay so let's mark up one of these one of these blanks Lining our diagram up with the edge of the drawing, we're going to use this little V, and that's going to mark the end of where I'm going to part with a parting tool. This line is going to be a V cut with a skew. This is going to mark the lowest point in the cove. Um, we're not going to uh, mark th these these points on these lines, but we will mark the one right in between that circle, uh, between those two two drill holes. Uh, we want to mark this line, which is the lowest part of this cove, and we're going to mark 
this line which is the right edge of the bead, the left edge of the bead, and where the parting where the parting tool will go. So now we've got it marked up and we can start start doing it. Now I think I might have mentioned it before. The best way to do this is to do one feature at a time and then just keep rotating out the stock. The advantages of this are you use one caliper setting, one tool rest setting, one tool, and you're doing the same step over and over and over. It sounds like it's a lot more trouble, but frankly it's really not when you got all your wood right there and you, just, you get in a groove and just do one feature at a time. So that's what we're going to do. To do that, I'm going to go ahead and mark I'm going to take just a moment and mark all, all four of these. Okay, before we get started, let's talk briefly about calipers. Uh, basically, the most common type for spindle use is going to be spring calipers. Uh, these are some grots. These are fairly nice. Uh, um, and the key is you need to round them off when you get them so they won't drag or hang up. And when you use these, it's not advisable to stick them down onto the spinning wood you rather pull them across the spinning wood and pull them out. Uh, you do have to check your measurements occasionally because you can spring these or, or, or get them to move. Here's a cheap set from Harbor Freight. came in a, a, with several others at a very uh, cheap price. Nice to have a couple of uh, two or three different uh, calipers. Vernier calipers uh, serve a, a somewhat similar purpose except they don't they don't sp uh, spring in and, in and out. Uh, one other type of caliper is that you've seen before is just using a basic wrench uh, to size and that can work real well and you can also use a relative reference if you need something one inch wide you know just put this up there and, and, and mark it uh, I can see that I've got a one inch and a 15 16 I'm gonna put a piece of tape on here just so in the heat of battle I don't get confused and, and size it too small you know what they say about Murphy's Law it's alive and well Murphy was an optimist. Okay, so let's get started. So I'm going to part this down uh, first right here where it's marked to fit the uh, the hole uh, on the bottom of the stool and then I'm going to do each one of them as I size it. Okay. Now you can safely hold this with your left hand. It, the ends are rounded over. And we're just going to start on the very end. So if I undersize it a little bit, it won't be too much of a problem. And this only rough size it. This will actually make the tenon slightly oversize. So it just gets as close to where we want to be. Let's talk just a moment about uh, drive centers. Um, I'm using a uh, three-quarter stab center. Uh, I have one that's a little larger, but the diameter is one and one eighth. Otherwise, I would have liked to have used this because it was it's closer to the size of the bottom, but I couldn't cut all the way down to the to the size of of one inch. So that one's out. Uh, this one's a possibility, but it's not spring loaded. Uh, but the size is very similar to that. Actually, this is probably even a better size for sizing the bottom than this. Uh, but that's a possibility. Uh, this is, these are the two, uh, two uh, OEM ones. I think this one came with a mini lathe, and I believe this one came with a Powermatic. These are okay, except that you tend to have to drive them in a little bit to get a good bite. And there's no reason to go to that much trouble. This will hold just fine, especially with its spring, spring load. For some spindle operations, a beading and parting tool uh, can be a very handy tool. A uh, bedan serves a similar purpose. I don't much care for a bedan, but I, and I made this beading and parting tool out of a piece of 3 8 by 6, uh, six inch uh, piece of high speed steel uh, tool blank. And it, it, it just cuts a little wider cut, but you can also use it for beading. Champ 
to that edge a little bit, make it easier to go in the hole. And just visualize it to make sure that it it, it looks uh, parallel. And now we're going to bring the our tool gate our hole gauge over. Now this gauge was drilled with the same drill bit that the stool was, uh, and I've, I've double checked to make sure they're the same size. It's just a little more convenient to come over with this than it is to bring the stool bottom. So we just quit. That's so much. Fun. Whoop. Looks like we missed the mark a little bit. We're going to have to be real careful on the next one. Uh, if, uh, if this is too sloppy in the tool, in the stool, there is a way to solve that problem. We simply take our handsaw. I did, can you believe I did this deliberately for this teaching point? You take a handsaw and you cut down to here and you put a very thin wedge in it. So when you hammer it in, it'll, it'll wedge on there and that'll solve that problem. Let's do the next one. And we're done. We're done sizing that. Now, the next operation we're going to do is we're going to cut this, uh, we're going to cut a V cut. Um, and make this, make this bead and make this cut through here. So we're going to put this mark on it and this mark on it. Now, when you go to uh, putting marks or sizing marks on it, there's three tools, actually four tools you could use. Uh, you can use the skew when you need little V-cuts. You th use a thin parting tool if you need something a, a hair wider. And for others, you can use your parting tool. Uh, there's no real need to use a beading and parting tool. So, in this case, here's the mark. We're going to put a V-cut here and and that's where we're going to stop. So using a point of the tool, I'm going to use a spindle gouge to go ahead and turn that large bead. Get that deep in there, I'm going to use the detail. And we've got it. And I like that. We could set up a gauge for that, but in this case, uh, it, it, we'd have to have a special uh, ground down real thin to fit into that kind of V cut. In this case, we're we're gonna, we're going to be able to eyeball this one just fine. There we are. So here we are, just working down the spindle, one detail at a time for all four of them then go to the next detail. Trust me, try it. I know some of you won't believe it, but it really does work and it allows you, it is far faster and far easier. Uh, I didn't believe it before, but I'm a believer now. If any of y'all have any comments or a better way of doing it, uh, or, or any tips, hey, please please comment and share it with everybody, because this is all about the learning experience on wood turning.
few turning te techniques I'd like to mention as we, we wrap up is use as few tools as possible and learn to get the most mileage out of those, out of those tools. Learn to use your skew. Uh, it's great for planing cuts. You just get a wonderful finish off the cut. It's great for doing V cuts, uh, for marking your piece. And it's also great when you finish sanding to come back and, and crisp up the detail on some of your, your features. Um, be sure to chamfer the end of the tenons that are going to go in a hole. To make long sweeping cuts, you can use the uh, use the skew. You can also use uh, a spindle roughing gouge. Just be careful as you come into the shoulder, and a spindle continental uh, continental spindle gouge uh, with a fingernail type of grind can also be effective for those long long sweeping curves. I want to talk very briefly about, about sanding. Um, you don't need to sand past about 180 if you're going to paint the item. Uh, maybe 220, 240 if you're going to add a finish. You don't need to go up to the higher grits uh, on furniture like you would a, a bowl or a hollow form. Um, sand with the, uh, with the grain between grits. Get rid of any, any of those marks. Reverse sanding is a good thing if your lathe, ha lathe has reversed. Uh, has reversed. If it doesn't, all you got to do is simply spin, turn the spindle in for end, and you can accomplish the same thing. Um, uh, an inexpensive, cheap source of sandpaper is from Klingspor, where you get cutoffs from their their rolls, and that makes great for spindle types of uh, sanding. You can get a, a order a bargain box for wood turners with lots of different grits in it, which which can be very very handy. I know most of us don't, don't aspire to be production turners and, and never will, but I hope this video was useful to you in providing some, uh, some tips and techniques that will help you in your turner, not only for the, uh, this spindle video, but, any, but, but in all three videos in this tool making uh, series. You don't have to make a YouTube video to give back uh, and share information on wood turning. Just make a comment, provide a suggestion, ask a question. It's all good. So until we meet next time, keep on turning and keep it safe.